Today we're going to look at Psalm 119, beginning in verse 81. Uh, before we do that, I had read this morning that um, Jim Bohannon's surgery went well yesterday, his shoulder replacement, and so we're going to continue to pray for him. Um, but uh, Psalm 119, beginning in verse 81, I just love this, uh, this phrase. As I was meditating on it this morning, lots of thoughts and comfort really came to my mind as I was reading it because I was able to answer the psalmist's questions to God uh, really out of, out of my own experience with God, and I'm sure you'll relate to it in your experience with God. But again, this is a part of the psalm where the, where the psalmist is expressing his distress over those who have come against him and laid traps for him and tried to bring him down. And mainly the primary reason is because of his righteousness. And his righteousness evidently created great conviction in their life. And so they're trying to bring him down. And he cries out in verse 81 and he says, My soul longs for your salvation. I, I love that language there. My soul longs for your salvation. Or my soul longs for your deliverance. I hope in your word. And he's reminding God and himself that as he's waiting for God's deliverance in the situation that his, he is in, that he puts his hope in God's word, his hope in God's promises. And that's great, a good thing uh, for us to remember that when we face different distresses or trials in life, and while we naturally will long for God's deliverance, for God to deliver us out of that situation, um, it's a natural longing to be delivered out of situations that are hard, hardships, uh, grieving, etc. But we need to be like the psalmist and put our hope in God's word. Our hope cannot rest in anything else except the word of God. And we're reminded that God's word, what he has spoken in his special revelation through the word of God, emulates from him and his character. So you can't separate the word of God from the nature and character of God. He cannot speak anything that is outside of his nature and character. And so at the very essence, the reason we can rely on God's word is because it's an expression of who God is. And so the psalmist says, man, in my distress, God, I'm longing for your deliverance. But God, in the midst of that, I'm going to hold on to your word. I'm going to take your promises to heart because they are yes and amen. And so I want to encourage you this morning that if there is a distressful situation that you're going through in life, whatever it is, our hope has to be grounded in God's word because that is our grounding, which is in him. And he says, my eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? My eyes, I look out. I, I'm, I'm continually on the watch, he says, for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? And again, it's not a bad question to ask of God. God, how long? I know in my life, when I've faced difficult times, very trying times, I have, I have sought God's promises. I have sought God's deliverance. And the natural question is, God, how long uh, is this going to take? Uh, the Bible says there's no temptation or there's no trial that has taken you except that which is common to man. And God, with that temptation, will provide a way of escape or a way of deliverance. God will deliver. And remember, we've, we've said the last few days that God never promises to immediately snatch us out of a situation. But God's promises are is that he will see us through to the other side in those circumstances. For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. Uh, we don't have wineskins today. Uh, a common uh, parallel would be a bottle. I become like a bottle that's, that's uh, been caught up in the smoke. In that time in that day, of course, fires were burned within the quarters, where, whether it a tent would be a tent dwelling or some other mud structure. And the smoke would build up in, in, that, in that home. And those bottles or those wineskins that would be hanging there would be, would be uh, soot-ridden. They would be filled 
was smoke. The outside would be uh, looked at as a, it was ragged and worn. And so that's the visual picture that he's relating as he is in the situation. I've become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. Again, man, we got to hold on to God's promises and his word. How long must your servant endure? Here he asks the question again. And it's kind of like you can almost see the battle in his mind. And we can see it in ours, too, if we, if we recall and relate to the situations that, that we're holding on to God's word. Yet at the same time, we're saying, God, how, I don't know if I can endure this any longer. God, I'm at the very end of my rope. And God says, yes, you can, because my grace is sufficient for you. As he reminded Paul when Paul spoke of that thorn in his flesh, that ailment that he had. And three times he asked God to deliver him from that. And God's response was, listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And sometimes God wants us to understand and know his grace. And it's more important for us to know his grace than it is for us to be delivered from that circumstance or that situation. Um, in other words, God's grace is far greater and it far outweighs the deliverance from a situation. Uh, when will you judge those who persecute me? He's wanting God's justice. He's wanting justice uh, to be meted out from God uh, towards those who have brought injustice in his life. Notice here that he, he relies on God's justice, not his own. He doesn't take it to himself to, to enact vengeance or try to bring justice himself, but he looks to the righteous judge, God who is the righteous judge, uh, to bring judgment against those who are persecuting him. The insolent, he says in verse 85, the insolents have, have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law, but all your commandments are sure they persecute me with falsehood. Help me. Again, the reason they were persecuting him was because he was holding to the word and the law of God. And he's reassuring. He's saying to God, God, I know that all of your commandments are sure. And they're persecuting me with falsehood. Help me, O oh God. They have almost made an end of me on earth. But I have not forsaken your precepts. You might even even see that as, yet even though they make an end of me on, on the earth, even though if it goes to the extent that they take my life, God, I have not forsaken your precepts. It's one thing to make a declaration about God or to God, but it's another thing to hold to those declarations in times of trial. We can say on a high Sunday morning, the Lord is good, God is good, and somebody can, can add to that all the time. It's one thing to declare that. It's another thing to live that through circumstances. You see, that's where the real truth test lies, is, is whether or not we can spout off uh, God's word and praises to him and still continue to live in that through life circumstances. That's the true test of trust and faith, isn't it? In verse 88, he concludes this stanza by saying, In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep your testimonies, or I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. God, by your steadfast love, by your mercies, God, by your compassion, God, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Um, needing the mercy of God to hold to, to keep the testimonies of God, the law of God. You see, we are incapable on our own of keeping the testimonies of God. We're incapable of our own to live out his law and his precepts. Um, we can do behavior modification and change some habits maybe, but that's all that is, is behavior modification. It requires and necessitates the graces and the mercies of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that we, we may walk in the Spirit. As I was reading this psalm this morning, I was reminded 
I have a couple of a couple of old hymns that I want to close with. This first one is very familiar to you. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why?
Jesus said that um, if he if he cares for the sparrow, uh, the sparrow doesn't doesn't labor, doesn't have to go find its food, but God provides. And in every situation, realize that, boy, if he cares for that little bird, that little sparrow, then you know he cares for you. How much more would he care for you? His special creation. He loves us and he cares for us. Hold on, hold on in faith and trust. I love you. I pray God's blessings on you. I pray that his face would shine on you today. Bask in his goodness the rest of the day. And ask the Lord, God, give me an opportunity today to share with somebody your love, your grace, your mercy. God, give me an opportunity to either plant a seed, God, that I, I might have an opportunity to cultivate the soil, of the seed that's already been implanted in their heart. And God, by your grace, I might be able to share in the experience of somebody coming to salvation. I prayed that yesterday and had an opportunity when I had to go to the eye doctor to get a pair of replacement glasses. And the young girl that was waiting on me, and she's about 21, sweet little girl, um, just having a good conversation with her. And uh, I know she comes from a home of faith, grew up in church. Um, I don't know where her, where her salvation lies. But I do know at the end of the conversation, she um, was thankful that we had that conversation. She's engaged to be married. And so we talked about marriage, and, and one of the key elements in marriage is, is having a relationship and walking with Christ. And uh, at the end of it, she said, I'm, I'm so glad that I had this conversation with you today. And I, I don't know what the Holy Spirit will do with that, uh, but God allowed me to be a part of that. And so pray and ask him to allow you today, give you opportunity, and be seeking that opportunity. I love you. God bless you. Have a great day.